Hello, welcome to the Texas Legislative Update. I'm David Blackman, and I'm here with Jason Modulin, as we are every week. He's the president of the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. Jason, how are you doing today? David, I'm doing well. It's great to be with you. It's always fun, man. It's always fun. Well, here we are. It's the week ending uh, April 14th, which means that in this 140-day session, we only got 46 days left. It's kind of hard to believe it's two thirds finished now. Um, and, uh, mercifully, and yeah, yeah, mercifully, <laughs> right. I talked to several folks down there this week, and everybody's saying this is just the the wildest legislative session they've ever ever been through. Really, with everything that's going on, I I wonder if do you feel that way too? Well, they're they're all different, and and so I I constantly have to. To remind myself that, 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 that they are all different, um, uh, but it, it, it does. Uh, we're in the uh, the doldrums right now, or, or um, uh, as as one of my other colleagues was describing, kind of the, the, we're in that spot where we always are at this point in session, where it looks like it's uh, it's pretty dark, and <laughs> we're not sure what's going to pass, and uh, you know everyone's looking at potential summer plans and. Yeah. wondering if they should buy insurance and you know things of that <laughs> nature and so um yeah there's a there's a good uh, amount of pessimism uh kind of hanging over the place right now but um i i, I think um you know yesterday was kind of a big test uh we, we thought uh um there would have been far more um clashing between the house and senate on on property taxes and and referring to bills and things of that nature and it, it seems like uh, uh cooler heads are prevailing the the uh you know uh fight promoters in the texas media uh just aren't aren't getting their way yeah <laughs> well, the so, fights are always uh, more fun right to uh yeah, yeah, more yeah clicks on stories for them. i think behind the scenes uh um the leadership is is, is kind of finding a way to to, to navigate <laughs> here and so um so that's that's always positive to to see yeah. some some glimmers of hope there yeah, it's nice to have adults in charge. That's that's uh, <laughs> it hasn't always been that way in the Texas legislature. So, uh, congratulations to Dade Phelan and and uh, and Dan Patrick for making that happen. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned property taxes. The House uh, passed their version of property tax cut this week. Uh, it's a little different than what came out of the Senate, but the, there's some similar stuff too. Uh, give us a rundown on what what's going on in that bill. Well, that's right. So uh, the House passed their bill yesterday. Uh, it would impose a 5% appraisal cap on both homesteads um, and mm -hmm. on on all other property. Uh, um, uh, so, so business property, um, commercial property would also experience the same benefit that, that homesteads currently experience with a 10% appraisal cap. Um, uh, the the bill also has a, a tax compression in it on on um, school tax rates, uh, which is important. That's that's the bulk of um, the current property tax relief, um, and then the appraisal cap would would be future tax relief. Um, uh, and and it's interesting. This week was kind of uh, um, again going back to those fight promoters. Uh, we're we're trying to um, kind of stoke stoke the flames to say the the senate's version uh maybe a higher initial property tax relief uh but the house could be longer term property tax relief um and if you poll voters and and uh as you know polls and and the uh, uh surveys can always be a little uh yes uh, uh there can be some thumbs on that scale sometimes um <laughs> Uh, but generally, uh, uh, a group out of the Houston area released a poll that said voters would prefer uh, dollars today as opposed to uh, potentially future dollars down the road. Um, that makes that makes sense in a lot of ways um, for legislators in the House. Um, what they hear from, though, when people are calling to complain is the appraisal. Yeah. Um, uh, that's that's where you get the sticker shock. Um, you see your appraisal jumping uh, in excess of 10% every year. You're never able to catch up 
with the actual taxable value. And so you just have it baked in that you're going to have 10% property tax increases, uh, appraisal increases, excuse me, um, uh, every year. And so, um, so that's where they get a lot of calls um, and, and a lot of very frustrated constituents. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, the Senate potentially uh, has, a, has a higher property tax relief uh, package. Um, and, and as you may remember from several years ago, when that, when they bought down, uh, rates, uh, pretty significantly, uh, while it's a ton of money, no one ever calls to thank them. <laughs> and so the house is looking at it and saying, we get all these call these negative calls on appraisals. Right. Let's address that issue. The Senate's saying, let, let's do something actually good for their pocketbooks. And the House is looking at it and saying, yeah, but we're not going to get calls thanking us for, you know, lowering property taxes. So um, I think in the end, both chambers, both authors uh, on the House and Senate side are committed to compressing the tax rate on m and taxes. Uh, that is an incredibly good thing for all taxpayers, not just homesteads, but, but also businesses. There's, there's agreement there. Um, and then, and then what else do they do? Is it a homestead exemption? Is it, um, a higher homestead exemption for seniors? Uh, or is there some element of, um, appraisal reform? So, um, uh, as you mentioned at the top, they got you know 44 days uh, to to work this out, and and uh, I think hopefully <laughs> they'll do that before uh, the end of May. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, so next on my list is carbon capture. Uh, I know that uh, what is it? Senate Bill 2107 had a mm -hmm. hearing this week. There's substantial controversy over uh, the integration. Um, provision in it and what threshold you have to have in terms of approval of landowners who own the poor space. Amazing. That's right. And uh, so there's not much agreement uh, uh, among all the interested parties there. Uh, yeah. Uh, prospect for, for getting to a solution. I know, I know the sponsor Senator Nichols has offered a compromise that uh, seems pretty daggum reasonable to me. Yeah, I think um, uh, so. That 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 bill was actually heard two weeks ago, uh, uh, March 29th, um, uh, in the Senate, um, and and Senator Nichols has been working very hard with all the parties to to try to bring them to the table and get them on board uh, with the solution. Um, and, and and meanwhile, the the application for primacy. Uh, continues to move forward at the EPA. Um, uh, Texas last session applied for that primacy uh, to make sure that that a state agency, in this case the Railroad Commission, uh, could decide on uh, those Class Six injection wells and 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 really start that process um, from a state perspective, as opposed to to kind of the dual uh, state and EPA process. Uh, with EPA permits right now running somewhere around five to six years. So, so um, you know, hopefully uh, they will they will move forward with something. Uh, certainly, those uh, ownership issues, particularly as you're starting to create uh, a unit um, uh, for storage, um, gets gets lots of people interested in and in, in monitoring that. Um, uh, and I think the threshold that that the railroad commission has established for for other types of of units, in this case, um, uh, longer uh, laterals that that may involve um, multiple mineral owners, is at a 66, 67 percent threshold. Um, uh, I think uh, Senator Nichols talked initially about a 70 to 75 percent threshold, um, uh, and so hopefully. Uh, they'll stay uh, low. Um, I think as you start to get into those higher percentage thresholds, um, that's really where you you empower the minority uh, to hold out as long as possible. And not that I I don't support that as well, uh, um, but um, it it delays projects pretty considerably 
um, uh, because it takes longer to get a deal together. Um, yeah, also, and you know, as you you know as well as I do that that you know these are big extents uh, in terms of the geographical land that's that's covered for these kinds of projects because you have to be able to control the whole uh, formation underground. Uh, for to capture the carbon properly, and and you could have hundreds of landowners involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The states, mineral state, I mean, uh, estates uh, have been so subdivided over the years. There's very very rare circumstance on on an onshore project where you're going to have a single landowner who you know you have to. I mean, it's always going to be multiple, and sometimes it can be an awful lot of people whose approval you have to get. And I mean. I know from from past experience when I was in the industry, sometimes you can't even find 70, 80 percent of the landowners. You don't even, you can't even find their ad, current addresses to, e right. to even give an opportunity to to sign off on it. So it's it's a tough deal. And, and you know, I can see it from both sides. I, I just certainly don't want landowners to to be denied their their due rights and process in all this. So it's uh as usual, these things are always a balancing act. Uh, and, it, it, no yeah. question. Uh, well, no question. Uh, uh, it is a balancing act, and that, and that's really where uh, the legislature uh, should be in, in, empowered to kind of take um, take a look at those and and come down on items. I, I would hope that they would just balance the potential for. Um, uh for delay um and, yeah. and and if they don't act um we're likely gonna sit and wait for a while um uh <laughs> for these projects to go to other states um yeah. and uh, uh potentially uh we 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 miss out um it'd be like uh, casino gambling right everybody's going to louisiana instead of keeping the money in texas that's <laughs> right and uh you know i'll uh <laughs> uh we, we we haven't talked about gaming uh, uh i guess in a week or so you know but uh, uh that's that's kind of some of these other items out here is is um uh, yeah, that's if, the, if the legislature doesn't act um there's no question that there's a potential that this investment goes goes somewhere else and and um uh and then you come back in two years and say see it did exactly as we said it would um uh in the absence of of legislative action um this activity would go elsewhere so um there's quite a few of things like that whether it's it's this or whether it's um uh property tax abatements and things of that nature where um if uh if the legislature doesn't act if other states uh step in um uh that activity will potentially go elsewhere yeah well, I know you uh, had some key hearings this week and offered some testimony uh, on multiple pieces of legislation. Talk about that. Yeah, so testified in uh, in House Ways and Means on Monday on that re-stimulation bill, the, the refracturing bill uh, mentioned uh, several times in the past, House Bill 2848, uh, excuse yeah. me, not, not uh, 2056, excuse me, there's... <laughs> All these numbers are running together yeah, now. You must be filing uh, a tax extension, huh? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 2848 is, is transmission, <laughs> and I'll get to that next. So 2056 <laughs> is uh, uh, a, a uh, enhanced oil recovery program for shale wells. Um, and um, uh, I think we, we made a pretty compelling case that uh, this activity is, is not occurring right now. Um, Rystad Energy, Energy did a study uh, last year that said that less than 2% of the wells, uh, less than 2% of completions um, on an annual basis are actually uh, uh, refractures um, uh, it, designed to re-enter a well bore, uh, not, not simply a, a misfrac right. or something. Um, and so, you know, there, we think there should be an incentive out there for it. Um, North Dakota, uh, earlier this year said, yes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and so they, uh, adopted a program where they cut the, uh, several stacks in half, uh, in order to allow operators to recapture, um, their re-stimulation cost. We, we brought that to the legislature. Um, one of the, 
process or procedural things that happen at the Texas legislature is every time a bill is heard in a committee, the committee chair has to request a fiscal note from the legislative budget board. Um, and so that that occurred for this bill. Um, and the initial assessment w w was a, a very high cost uh, uh, to the state of Texas. Um, uh, we're, we're equally perplexed as to uh, how that how, how you could come up with that uh, number. Um, and so yeah, it doesn't trying, seem to make sense, really, but trying to dig into that and uh, uh, work on amendments and, and, and substitutions that, that potentially uh, reduce or eliminate any cost um, associated with the bill. Uh, we'll see how we do. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're working uh, through the weekend to try to get uh, kind of a substitute in place and, and allow the Ways and Means Committee and Chairman Meyer to, to, to um, consider it and, and, and hopefully move it forward. I think we have kind of broad support for the idea. Um, uh, it's just um, uh, it's 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 hard to pass bills that have large fiscal notes uh, yeah. in place unless um, you know there's just widespread agreement that this is something that we want to uh, to to take the hit on and and, and potentially budget around. So. Uh, so uh, if not, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and kind of similar talking points, um, we'll go another two years where we'll point out to legislators and to the comptroller's office that this activity is not occurring. Um, uh, and because North Dakota has taken action uh, to attract this type of investment, um, North Dakota will experience uh, some re-stimulations over the next two years. Um, and then we potentially come back to the legislature and so uh, it, it didn't bear out quite the way you projected it, that, that this activity would happen uh, in the absence of legislative activity. And so uh, now we're, we're back again to ask for the same thing. You, you hate to talk like that with, with 44 days to go, but um, uh, that, yeah. that may potentially be the, the circumstance we're in. Well, it'd be a shame to lose that resource. I mean, the, the potential recoveries, um, from from re-stimulating those wells is when you accumulate all that volume together from all those wells is an enormous potential resource, mm -hmm. uh, not just for Texas, but for the United States and the world. And, uh, you know, it'd be a shame to leave it in the ground. Um, but, oh, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll get there. That's right. That's right. What about uh, on uh, anything on, on grid reform? Uh, Transmission yeah. bills. Yeah, so uh, a great point. Uh, uh, also testified in Senate Business and Commerce yesterday uh, in support of uh, Chairman Schwartner's bill um, on uh, transmission items and and really um, trying to uh, lower the the burden that transmission utilities have to prove um, before they can start a project. And this is called a certificate of convenience and necessity, which is now we're really getting into the weeds and, and uh, uh, out of my depth because I, 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 I really do not know much about PUC and ERCOT. Uh, everything I've learned has been over the past two years, but um, uh, a transmission utility has to prove that either there is a necessity for reliability or that there is a necessity for economic reasons um, in order to then approach uh, ERCOT uh, and say that, that this line is desirable. Then they spend the next five to six years um, negotiating with landowners, proving up that there's been an open process there, that they've had multiple um, uh, landowner engagement and stakeholder meetings, that they've proven uh, uh, that, that the line will be... Um, uh, in line with, with FERC standards as far as uh, safety and, and, and those types of things. Um, and so that that whole process um, can run seven, eight, nine years. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> you know, the pace of oil and gas development, particularly right now um, with the pressures that are coming from emissions, uh, pressures that are coming uh, externally from EPA on uh, declaring the Permian Basin non, in non-attainment status. I mean, there's so many things forcing oil and gas producers to get off of diesel, 
get off of gas fired equipment, move to electricity um, from an efficiency standpoint, from a lower emission standpoint, um, uh, and winterization. Winterization requires electricity. Uh, all of these things have developed just a higher and higher demand uh, for electricity. And yet, <laughs> transmission utilities report to us and to the legislature um, that that they still need some help um, compressing timelines, compressing some of their their standards, and and I think rightfully industrial customers uh, look at that and say I, I do not want to give a blank check to people building transmission lines. Yeah. Uh, I mean we already have very high transmission costs in the state because of the investment in CRES because of the uh, the sheer size of our state. We, we spend a lot of money on transmission. Why do I want to give a blank check uh, to build more transmission lines? And so, it, you know, we need a balancing act there. Again, the legislature to engage. I think right now the rules, as they're, they're, they're kind of articulated at the Public Utility Commission, it's a very narrow eye of the needle <laughs> to prove a project. Um, and it takes a long time. And then ultimately, there's this hammer on the back end where the, where the Public Utility Commission can look at a transmission utility and say that that we are not uh, um, allowing you uh, to justify some of these costs. And so if they overpay for um, uh, a right-of-way access or um, – they uh, double string the line because they think there'll be potential growth down the road and, and they'd rather double string it rather than single string it. The PUC can just come in and say, no, uh, that's that's not allowable. And, and so that company takes a hit, their investors take a hit. I mean, just all these things kind of compound and they get pretty gun shy the next time around. So um uh, Senator Fortner, I think, is rightfully trying to balance all of those competing interests. Uh, uh, he had a hearing yesterday, uh, which I thought went, went went very well. Most of the opponents uh, of which are generators and manufacturers and large industrial customers were generally uh, on the bill, so neutral. Um, and, and then uh, we had quite a few oil and gas and transmission utilities that uh, were supportive of the bill. And... Uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll see Senator Schwartner kind of take all that input, uh, come up with subs a substitute bill, uh, and move forward. Um, and then, and then ultimately, uh, you know, those summer plans that I was mentioning are going to have me at the Public Utility Commission and at the ERCOT uh, trying to figure out, okay, how do we continue to push here um, uh, to make sure that these projects are are, are moving forward? So. Um, uh it's uh <laughs> it never ends right it's a new policy area that i'm not uh you know uh, not not very strong in and trying to uh, uh make friends and and not make too many enemies at the same time and <laughs> um uh but we, we know that there is documented need and demand there um and so uh we've got we've got some, some some pretty big oil and gas companies, but then also some smaller ones that that are anxious to to find ways to connect to the grid um, and, and and just don't have the ability to do so right now. Yeah. Well, what about next week? Going to be a, a slow week next week in Austin. <laughs> well, I, I'll put a plug in. I, I'm, I'm getting to Wichita Falls on Monday. We do an annual golf tournament uh, in, in April, and so uh, I'm, I'm headed there, uh, uh, leaving leaving most of the team here in place, and and, and running up there to play a little golf with some Good. of our members on on, on Monday. Uh, so excited for that, but, um, yeah, I'm going to be burning, uh, morning and midnight <laughs> oil to get there and get back. Um, uh, but Monday is a pretty key day in the house. Uh, we have talked about this in the past. Um, uh, so, um, uh, former speaker, Tom Craddock has, uh, introduced a proposal, the last two legislative sessions. Uh, called the Grow Fund, um, uh, which is basically taking a portion of severance tax dollars and dedicating those back um, uh, to the counties by which 
generated that that wealth um uh and rewarding them with a grant program so that they can allocate it towards roads healthcare, education infrastructure maybe broadband those types of things that are experiencing high growth uh due to oil and gas production and and people moving in while at the same time severance taxes go to the state uh uh the, really the benefit uh for local governments is is that sales tax and that and that property tax appraisal but but that property tax uh is a laggard is lags behind the activity so so local governments uh experience uh growth uh quicker than than they have the ability to recover it so um uh um uh, Speaker Craddock has that bill. At the same time, uh, uh, Chairman Brooks Landgraf uh, out of Odessa, um, uh, so next door to Midland, uh, has a, a proposal called the the Strong Bill. Um, uh, so you got grow and you got strong. Um, uh, strong would would be a little bit different. Um, instead of um, making uh, all counties that are uh, generating severance tax dollars eligible for these grants. Uh, it would really focus on kind of the top 15% of counties um, that generate severance taxes, uh, thereby making those grants a little bit larger uh, um, for those those counties. Um, and then he also has uh, some other appropriation potential to uh, the Texas Emission Reduction Program and um, and and then the operating budget at at the Railroad Commission. Um, uh, uh, of which does not exp uh, receive severance tax dollars right now um, directly. So uh, it, two interesting dynamics. The, the Senate has traditionally been um, uh, the impediment, if you will, um, uh, generally oppose uh, dedication of tax revenues. Um, uh, they like it to go into one pot and then yeah. from there appropriators can can kind of decide where where it goes from there uh whereas the house has been a little more open to these types of of, of things um about a decade ago uh we did the county road program uh where basically we took a portion of severance tax dollars and dedicated it back to those counties and and, and really it was a it was a necessity in the Eagleford, uh, although the Permian Basin um, was able to receive quite a few tax dollars uh, right. as part of that process uh, to really fix a lot of roads that were needed. Uh, uh, Highway 158, uh, you know, between St. Angelo and Midland um, was the deadliest highway in America. Um, and, and now it's a it's a beautiful four lane uh, state highway uh, that that. Uh, I can confidently say has saved my life a number of times um, uh, because when it was a two lane highway, um, you were, you were in the bar ditch quite a bit to uh, yeah. make sure you weren't getting uh, uh, hit. Um, oh, and uh, you you know, forward was a, was a mess. Before it was, the sun was it was. Down in uh, Texas, so it was a big deal. So, uh, you know, um, uh, We'll, we'll see kind of what gets out of the house uh, and then ultimately what's the appetite in the Senate. Um, uh, uh, Craddock's bill is, is kind of, let's try to be as broad as possible, try to get as many legislators on board. Uh, um, Landgraf's bill may be more focused on kind of the appropriation side. And, and, and if appropriators on the Senate side have been the impediment, maybe this one kind of, unlocks the the lock if you will um and gets it moving forward so uh that'll happen on monday it'll, it'll be um uh I, I don't think there'll be much issue in the house with with getting the bills out it'll be what happens in the senate what's the appetite um uh to do those types of programs in the senate well boy what a week what a week <laughs> uh, just as a parting note i wanted to uh just as an aside, point out that uh, the House voted this week almost unanimously to approve a bill that would put the state full time on daylight savings time. And I, I want to warn people, don't get too excited about that, because even if the Senate approves it and the governor signs it, it's got to be approved by Congress to stay permanently on daylight savings time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Congress has never approved 
a proposal like that. This and and something like a dozen states have done this previously. So that's kind of a, you know, I don't even know why they're doing it other than to go back home and say, well, you know, we voted to to stop this and. You know, if they would vote, the other side of it is if they'd vote to permanently stay off of daylight savings time, it doesn't have to be approved by Congress. And that's so right. This is a bill that is, you know, a bridge to nowhere, folks. So don't get too <laughs> too enthusiastic about it. Anyway, it'll be interesting though because they basically voted to stay on El Paso time, right? And so, yeah. so. That you know, you draw the line, uh, you know, across the Rockies and, and, and include all of, uh, of of the Red River and the, and then the Sabine. So, um, uh, <laughs> I, my one of my favorite memories is uh, uh, it, 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 this came up in the legislature about a decade ago, and and, and similar proposals, and and the legislators ha had quite a bit of fun on the floors. Yeah, maybe we, maybe we don't go an hour, maybe we only go a half hour. Isn't that a better <laughs> approach? We just we we move Texas up half an hour. That'll fix everything, and uh, uh, forget the rest of the country, you know, and. Uh, and that'll be the Texas time is, is, Texas is time. half an hour in between. Uh, and <laughs> Let's assert yeah. our independence. I, you know, <laughs> all I know is twice a year, it costs me a lot of sleep. And I'm oh, hard to yeah, do it. absolutely. Messes up Fix the kid, it. messes up the parents. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so it would be nice. And I don't know, you know, we, we, we started that uh, uh, the early seventies. I mean, that, just to, to address some energy issues. Uh, uh, it's Ben Franklin's idea, uh, but we're not, you know, we're not burning lamp oil anymore. So right. um, to the extent that it's saving a, uh, a, uh, uh, a half a percent of electricity. I, I, I just doubt it. Um, it's such a headache for people. Yeah, it really is. Anyway. Okay. Enough of that. Enough of that. <laughs> I guess that's everything we wanted to cover this week. Um, I appreciate your time as always. It's always enjoyable and uh, hope you have a great weekend. I hope you have a great weekend too. And um, uh, it's, it, it, it's starting to it's starting to come to an end. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll have hopefully we'll have big things to report over the next few weeks on on legislative activity. Yeah, it's going to be a big sprint from here on out to the finish. So that's right. That's right. Anyway, that's great. And have a great weekend. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will talk to you next week.